Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Corps. Today we're going to take a look at the Super Dock, which is made for the AYN Odin. Now they're calling this thing a 15-in-1 dock. I'm not really sure where the 15 is coming from, but there are quite a lot of features. In addition to just working like a regular dock, it also has ports for things like GameCube and Nintendo 64 controllers. And the dock costs $50 right now on the AYN Indiegogo page, or you could also buy it as part of the Super Pack, which is available for each model. This will include things like an HDMI cable, screen protector, as well as a case and a bag for your device. And there's actually two different video out functions on this dock. On the Odin Lite, it's going to require you to use the micro HDMI port on the top, which will then feed out a 1080p signal on the right. And the Basin Pro models will just directly have an HDMI port doing 4K60 out of the back. It also has space for a hard drive if you want to add that, and a couple other tweaks that we'll get into here in a minute. So let's take a deep dive in the Super Dock and see if it's going to be worth your time and money. Without any further delay, let's jump into it. All right, quick unboxing here. Not a lot going on with the user manual here, just a couple diagrams. It does show you how to install the hard drive and then how those two different video out functions work. Inside, you're also gonna get a power brick as well as a charging cable. The brick is rated for 65 watts. Right now, the packaging on the dock is pretty cheap looking. It's just held together with scotch tape. And here's what the dock looks like itself. It looks pretty good. It's nice and sleek looking. The front has two Nintendo 64 and then two USB 3.0 ports. Each side also has GameCube inputs and the left side also has the HDMI out port. On the back, we have an ethernet jack, three USB 3.0, the HDMI out for 4K and 60 Hertz, and then the power input with USB-C. And that's really it around the sides here, and the bottom just has an air vent, and it looks to be no branding or anything. The dock comes with a removable acrylic screen cover here, and like I mentioned, there is space here for a 2.5 inch hard drive. So let's open this up and actually install one to see how it functions. Now actually getting this hard drive enclosure exposed is actually quite a pain in the butt. I found the only way to actually get it open was to put a little screwdriver in here and then just kind of leverage it out. And it's surprisingly hard to take off. It turns out on the back side, there are four clips along the edges, but the thing is held so tightly in there that you can't get to those clips. So you're really just gonna have to pull it right out. Also, apparently you're supposed to take the screen cover off when you do this. I forgot to do that initially, but this is how it comes out. So at first I was thinking I was gonna use a two terabyte hard drive like the ones you would find on a laptop. But right before I installed it, I realized that the read and write speeds on this were probably not gonna be very great. And I wanna give the Odin every chance it has to give good performance. So instead I decided to use a solid state drive that I had lying around. So this one's only 240 gigs, so not the biggest solid state drive in the world, but still this could fit maybe like 100 GameCube games. Either way, regardless of what type of hard drive you use, just make sure it's two and a half inches and then it just slides right in. There is no place to secure it with screws or anything else like that, but luckily the hard drive enclosure itself is so tight with those clips that it's not going to be a concern at all. Anyway, let's close everything up, and then at this point I realized that I did everything out of order with this review and I forgot to weigh it before the hard drive. Now the hard drive itself weighs about 40 grams, so as you can imagine here it's about 350 grams altogether for the dock, so that's pretty lightweight. And so now that I have that acrylic cover off, I can actually show you that dock mechanism now. And it feels a little bit flimsy, but to be honest, the Switch one does too. Also of note here on the sides, it has these little plastic strips that's supposed to help with airflow when you dock the device itself. But yeah, overall, this mechanism does feel relatively cheap. Okay, for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna use the back HDMI connection here because that's gonna be what's connected via USB-C when I plug in my Odin Pro. Okay, so now that we have an idea of what the outside looks like here, we've installed the hard drive, let's put that acrylic screen cover back on and get a feel for what it's like to actually dock the device into the mechanism. And it is a pretty tight fit here, as you can see, but it is nice and snug. As you can see here, there is very little movement when you have that acrylic screen cover on. I do feel like the screen scrapes a little bit against the acrylic case here, and that does worry me a little bit, especially if you or your kids are gonna be docking this thing a lot. Now, obviously the same thing could be said about the Nintendo Switch, but it does give me some pause. So let's try it without the acrylic screen cover. And this feels a lot less secure. As you can see here, it wobbles in place from left to right. And if you were to push it back and forth, it also wobbles too. Now, I don't know how often you're gonna be messing with the Odin while it's docked. And so probably in that regard, it doesn't really matter how secure it is, but it is much more secure with the acrylic cover. So I would say for all intents and purposes, not talking about the software at all, it does make sense to have the acrylic cover on it. But as you'll see later in the video, there are many reasons why you're probably not gonna to wanna to have it anyway. 
And just real quick, I'm going to remove these little protectors around each side of the acrylic cover. And I'm going to see if that changes the fit of the Odin in the dock at all. And it doesn't. It's just as tight. And yeah, it does feel nice and secure. As you plug it in, I do get an alert here about an unsupported Kingston hard drive. And we'll deal with that later when we actually set the hard drive up. And it probably seems very obvious to you, but once I docked this and I had it turned on, I realized that touching the screen was going to be impossible. And given the fact that this is an Android-based device, and the fact that you're going to be touching the screen a lot to get through the menus and whatnot, I can see why they made that acrylic cover detachable. So let's go ahead and start hooking things up. I'm going to hook up my HDMI connection here. Might as well do the Ethernet while I'm at it. And obviously I'm going to plug in the charging cable as well. So that's going to be our bare minimum hookups, and this is what it's going to look like once you have it docked. When you first dock it, it is going to take a second to register your button presses, but after maybe five seconds or so, it is going to work. For the purposes of this video, I am going to leave the acrylic cover off because I am going to access the screen a lot when I do all my configuration. First thing, under the Odin settings, you have two different video output modes. Now mine is already set to the Type-C 4K 60Hz, but this is where you would change it to the micro HDMI output on the top of the device. So first things first, let's test this out in a kind of real world docking scenario. I'm going to connect it to a Bluetooth controller here, and then I'm going to load up my launch box and navigate through my games and then start up a game. Now I'm using a D input signal with my 8 do controller, which means it's basically an Android signal. And I will say, at least as far as the navigation goes here, this was a relatively plug and play experience. As soon as I hooked it up, I was able to control the navigation. And then when I started up RetroArch via the LaunchBox front end, everything did work correctly. That being said, I was getting quite a lot of input delay, like I was feeling a lag from the controller. And at first I thought it was because I needed to turn on Run Ahead, but it turns out I already had that enabled. So when you turn off Run Ahead in RetroArch, it gets even worse. And so personally, I would say when it comes to retro gaming, the amount of input lag that I'm feeling here is what I would consider to be unplayable. Now, the honest truth is that even when I'm using a Bluetooth controller and it's not docked, I also still find the input delay to be really bad. When I'm using the device itself, I have no complaints. You know, turning on Run Ahead does make things even a little bit snappier, but all the same, I wouldn't say there is a lot of input delay from the device itself. But Bluetooth controllers is a different story. So that kind of splashes some cold water on the whole experience here, but let's try it with some more modern games. Let's do something with GameCube instead. Now, of course, first thing I notice is that the button inputs are not registered at all by the Dolphin emulator. And that's because the Dolphin emulators on Android do not have different controller profiles. They basically just have one way of inputting your controls. And what that means in a real world scenario like this is that you're going to have to go in and remap your controls anytime you go from undocked to docked mode. And sure, it only takes a minute to go through and remap everything, but it definitely takes away from that kind of seamless experience of docking the device and then just jumping right back into your game. So with GameCube and other standalone emulators, not only will you have to remap the controls when you dock it, you will then have to remap the built-in controls of the Odin when you undock it. And depending on your level of tolerance, that might be quite annoying. Now when it comes to input lag, I was feeling it again via Bluetooth in this emulator. I would say it's not quite as bad as it is with retro games. For example, I would consider this to be playable, but it did take me a while to kind of adapt to that amount of lag, and it just wasn't a fun experience. That being said, it didn't feel like a game-breaking delay like it did on the NES. So let's try out a USB controller instead and see if this feels any different. And sure enough, I'm going to have to remap the buttons all over again. After I take a minute to do that, I'm able to jump right back into the game, and it actually feels quite a bit better using a wired connection than it does a Bluetooth one. So if you don't already own a controller and you're looking to buy one and you're also planning on using a dock or at least plugging this device into your TV, at least for now, I would recommend using a wired controller or one that has a 2.4 gigahertz connection because it seems like those are going to be faster than it is on Bluetooth. Now, when it comes to playing Android games, those that have actual controller support, you aren't going to need to remap your buttons at all. It's just going to work natively. But depending on how your button layout is and what your preferences are, you may want to change the ABXY mode in the Odin settings between the Odin and Xbox mode. But of course, that's going to be personal preference, just like it is on the gamepad itself. Now, here's the thing that's frustrating about some controllers. For example, the B-top controller that I'm using here. I'm not quite sure what kind of signal it's giving, whether it's X input or D input. But either way, the Odin was not picking up on it via RetroArch. Instead, RetroArch was preferring to use the native controls on the device itself as player one. And so what I ended up having to do as sort of a workaround was go into the RetroArch settings and then go into the input settings and then reassign which one was port one and which one was port too. And this allowed me to make RetroArch think that the BTOP controller is player one, but even then it actually wouldn't register correctly. So I had to kill RetroArch and then remap all of the buttons manually. At that point, it did work properly, but the ABXY buttons were mapped all over the place. 
Instead of the traditional A and B, I was having to use B and Y as my A and B buttons. And that could be any number of factors that are affecting that. That could be RetroArch itself, it could be my mapping configuration, it could be the remap file, it could be the ABXY mode in Odin settings. And that sounds like a lot, but my point here is that it's not a plug and play experience. So if you're used to the Nintendo Switch where you just kind of load it into the dock and then grab whatever controller you want and then everything just starts working like that, this is unfortunately not going to be the same case. You're going to have to learn the often confusing in and outs of RetroArch in order to have multiplayer gameplay on this using retro games. For the standalone emulators, it might be a little bit easier, but that's all going to depend on that app itself. So overall, that's kind of a disappointing experience, at least with the USB-C controller. Now the thing is, I actually own a couple GameCube controllers, so we're going to try that instead. This is actually my OG controller from back in like 2002 or whenever when I first bought the GameCube. And it plugs in nice and easily and actually feels really nice when you first plug it in. And it immediately starts working with the Android navigation, so that's a pretty cool sign. So obviously the first thing I did is I started up the Dolphin emulator so I can play GameCube games with the GameCube controller. And naturally when I went in to map the controller, I set it to the GameCube adapter instead of doing the emulated one you would typically do with an external controller. And it turns out that this actually is not being registered as a GameCube controller within the settings. When I set it to GameCube adapter and start up a game, it doesn't work at all. So what you have to do is actually treat it like an emulated GameCube controller, even though you are actually using a GameCube controller. So you just go in here and go to emulated and then remap all of the buttons as you would expect. And one nice thing here is the analog triggers are still registered as analog within the app itself. So everything's going to work exactly like it should. And thanks to the fact that it is plugged in, there doesn't seem to be a lot of input latency either. It feels relatively responsive. And so this is the dream, right? To be able to play GameCube games on your device plugged into a modern TV. Well, unfortunately, here's the bummer about this. Despite the fact that the wired connection does give you less input delay, it unfortunately doesn't feel as great of an experience as I was hoping it would. The way I think about it is I tried my hardest to just pretend that I was playing an actual GameCube on my TV. But the honest truth is the input delay, as well as the stutters that happen here and there, plus the fact that the Dolphin MMJR is not the most accurate emulator in the world, what it really comes down to is that I couldn't forget the fact that I was running an emulated system. I was really hoping that this could basically recreate the GameCube experience, but for me at least, and of course this is only my one opinion, playing GameCube on this device did not recreate that feeling. That's a bit of a bummer. Now moving along here, I did want to try out GameCube in different settings as well. So same thing here, I remapped all the buttons within RetroArch. And much like with the BTOP controller, I had all sorts of issues. And again, there's probably a way to find a fix for this. It's going to be a matter of readjusting your remap controls, seeing what the core actually is requesting. And then of course, going into your input settings within RetroArch. But all of those things combined are a little bit frustrating. This is very far from a plug and play experience when you just want to play retro games. You're not just going to be able to dock your device and just start playing the games immediately. What that really means is you'll have to remap within each individual emulator and then do some investigation within RetroArch to find that perfect balance between broken and working. And as everyone knows, RetroArch can be a little bit finicky. You have to have all the settings dialed in perfectly correct or else you're going to start to have issues. And this is one of those use cases where it is probably solvable but I'm not really sure it's going to be worth all that effort. Now, just like with the other wired controller, this one works just fine with Android games. But really, I'm not sure if you're going to want to use a GameCube controller to play things like Horizon Chase. It is kind of a surreal experience to use a GameCube controller on a modern game like this. I've never had this experience before. Okay, let's move on to messing with that hard drive that we installed earlier. Now, one thing I do want to make a note is that when I first started up this whole filming process here, my battery was at 74%, and within an hour or two of testing, it was down to 68%. So even though Odin says that the dock can do fast charging, that's not the experience I was getting. In fact, it was slowly depleting the battery when I was having the device on and playing games. So that's also kind of a bummer too, because I was really looking forward to being able to play this in portable mode, then docking it, and then charging it, and still playing it at the same time time and then pulling it off the dock when I'm ready to start playing in portable mode again. But unfortunately the amount of battery drain that I was getting just from playing GameCube games is an indication that maybe this isn't going to work as they intended. Anyway, I think the community is going to probably test this more thoroughly here later, but this is at least my initial impressions. Okay, so let's end this tangent and go back to the hard drive here. Now under the storage settings, it is going to ask you to format the drive first. And I assume here it's because the hard drive shipped with an NTFS file system, and so they want to change it to XFAT in order to be readable within Android. So not a big deal here, I do recommend formatting the hard drive so that you can use it. And now once it's done formatting, I can go into the settings and there it is right there. And it's set up for portable storage like it is with an SD card. 
Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy over some games from the SD card over to the hard drive itself. So I'm gonna pick a PSP game as well as a GameCube game and we'll just go from there. The biggest thing I wanna see is whether or not the dock can play from SD and hard drive at the same time. So let's go into the PSP emulator first and you guessed it, I have to go in and remap all of the buttons. Like I mentioned, this may become an annoyance to you. So within the app here, I'm going to try and launch a game from a different location. Right now it's set for the SD card, but I'm gonna actually open up the hard drive instead. And I moved over OutRun 2006, so we'll go ahead and test this one out here. And so yeah, it's running from the hard drive and it's running great. So in that regard, this is a big win. You can put a ton of games on an external hard drive and then access them while your device is in docked mode. So let's exit out of the menu. And as you can see here in the recent games, it's showing not only the games on the SD card, but the ones on the hard drive too. That's why you're seeing two different versions of OutRun 2006. So let's try loading up a game from the SD card and see if it still works. And yeah, just like that, I'm also booting from an SD card instead. So what this means, at least for PSP, that you can have both games on your hard drive and the SD card and they'll both work fine when docked. In fact, I'm able to boot up the SD card version of OutRun 2006 and it's running no problem too. So let's go ahead and try the same thing, but with Dolphin instead. And within here, I'm going to hit the plus button, then navigate to where the hard drive is, and then I'm gonna boot up the one game I loaded here, which is Crash Nitro Kart. And just like that, they are both showing up now. And I'm not sure which one is from the SD card and which one is from the hard drive. So I think the only scientific way to go about this is to launch them both. So here's the first game, it's working fine. And let's go ahead and try launching the second one. And this one also is launching fine. So much like with the PSP emulator, you can put games on the SD card and the hard drive and they both should launch. Now, of course, my controller is not working here and that's because it's still remapped to the GameCube controller that I had plugged in earlier in the day. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is getting kind of annoying. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing with PS2, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently this time. Instead of copying the game over, I'm actually just gonna move it over to the hard drive, which means it's gonna remove it from the SD card, and then it'll only be housed in the hard drive itself. So in the PS2 settings, I went in and added the hard drive as an additional content location for the PS2 emulator. And so now it has both the SD card and the hard drive. So I'm gonna go into the settings here and scan for new games. And sure enough, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 is now showing in the games list again. So honestly, I think this is probably the most interesting feature of the dock altogether. For example, if you wanna have a larger library on that external hard drive to only play while hooked up to the TV, you can do that. And then also you can have your choice favorite games on the SD card, which you could play both in portable and docked mode. So it's kind of a cool solution if you wanna be able to have a bunch of games available when you want to play them on the TV, but then only have a rotation of your favorite games available on the portable side. And so in that case, I do think the hard drive enclosure option here is a great feature. But here's the big secret about the dock altogether. While it has some pretty neat features to it, you can do all of these things via the USB-C port anyway. So if you already own a USB-C dock and you wanted to plug it into your Odin, you could then use that dock to do things like charging the device, hooking up external controllers or hard drives, and using it for video out. So for the rest of this video, I'm gonna do all sorts of video things here, but without the dock. First, we're gonna try the micro HDMI cable here, just gonna plug it directly into the top of the device, and then I'll plug it into my game capture card. Now this has a max resolution of 1080p and 60 hertz. And when you first hook it up, if it's already set to 4K, it's gonna ask you to change to HDMI 10 1080p instead. And so when you make that switch, it is going to reboot your device. But after that, it works fine and it's capturing at 1080p, 60 hertz, and it looks pretty good. Now, personally, I think one of the better use cases for this is to actually play it in handheld mode like this. And so yeah, here I am playing with an HDMI signal directly to my game capture card and it's working really well. Now, that being said, the audio is all messed up, but I learned while making this video, it's because I had a bad cable. And this isn't the first time this cable has given me issues, so I went ahead and ordered a new one, but unfortunately it didn't come in time for this video here. Either way, I fully expect HDMI audio to work just fine, provided you don't have a crappy cable like me. So now let's test the USB-C port. Now here I have a USB-C to HDMI adapter, but you could also use a USB-C dock that had all sorts of features added to it. This is just the most bare bones solution that I have. Okay, and plugging this one in, it asks me to change the video output mode again. So I'm gonna go ahead and reboot the device one more time. And yeah, just like before, this plugged in and started working immediately. On top of that, I could switch between a 1080p and a 4K display and I would adjust my capture card. Everything worked perfectly. And when using it in handheld mode like this, I didn't have any sort of input delays either from the video or from my controls themselves. This was actually a really fun experience. Now I would recommend if you do wanna play it like this to get a USB-C dock as well, something that's gonna both have HDMI out as well as power in. That way when you plug this in and you're playing on the TV, it's also not gonna drain the battery a bunch. 
But yeah, overall, when you plug this in, you're going to have a plug and play experience because you don't have to remap the controllers or anything else like that. You can just play it in handheld mode. But of course, I'm not satisfied with just trying it in handheld mode. Let's try a Bluetooth controller and see how this works. And because I had so many issues with retro gaming, I'm going to do retro games again. This time Super Mario Bros. 2, my favorite Nintendo game of all time. And it's a shame they never made a sequel to this, but all the same, I'm feeling a huge amount of input delay when I'm playing. In fact, much like how it was when I was using the dock, this is completely unplayable. So I don't think that's the dock's fault. I think this has to do with the input delay that's embedded in Android and the fact that the Bluetooth connection itself has its own input delay as well. Overall, not a pleasant experience. Couple other observations here, it will charge smaller peripherals. For example, I was able to charge my controller via the dock. But of course, most other USB-C docks will do the same thing as well. But it's nice to see that it works. Okay, so now let's have some fun with some other things. First, an observation that the Odin does not fit inside of a Nintendo Switch dock. And it has to do with the grips that are along each side. And I'm pretty sure the OLED Switch dock isn't gonna work either. Now I also happen to have a USB-C extension cable, so I'm going to plug this into the Nintendo Switch dock and then see if it'll pick up on the Odin and then I can display it on the TV. And it's a little bit awkward shoving this in here, but I will say that it does charge the device. But all the same, I was not able to get any sort of video out connection at all. And I really wasn't expecting it, but all the same, I'm not really sure what the use case would be if you really would want to use a Nintendo Switch dock with this device. Either way, I don't think it's going to work when it comes to video out. Now, let's try the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm going to plug in my official Nintendo plug here into the Odin dock. And first, I want to test to see whether or not the Odin is going to work with this cable too. And yeah, sure enough, it works just fine. It does charge the device. And I'm also getting good video output too. So that's kind of interesting. I can use the output adapter from the Nintendo Switch to work in the Odin dock. And next up, we're gonna actually plug in the Nintendo Switch into the Odin dock and see if that works. And sure enough, it works like a charm. It can charge the Nintendo Switch and it gives me nice crisp video out as well. Now, a lot of people say you're not supposed to use a third-party dock with the Switch, but everything I've read, this all got resolved like three years ago at this point. So there is no harm when putting in a Nintendo Switch into a third-party dock like this. Anyway, Nintendo Switch does work. One other thing people asked me to try out is the 8-bit Do arcade stick. Now, I'm going to use the 2.4 gigahertz connector here just because I don't trust the Bluetooth and I don't want to get the cable out. So I'm going to turn it to Xbox mode. And just like that, it's working just fine, having no issues at all. And thankfully, RetroArch picked it up perfectly so I didn't have to do any sort of remapping or anything. And to be honest, the input latency is not bad at all. It feels a lot like a wired controller. I would say this is completely playable. Of course, if you're going to use an arcade stick, you're probably going to want to play arcade games. So here's a little bit of footage of me playing Final Burn Neo via RetroArch, and it works just fine. Like with the NES, I didn't have to remap the controls at all. Of course, you could go in and change your input settings and make a remap for individual games. For example, with the Street Fighter games, you may want to do that just to have everything lined up perfectly. Right now, the RB and LB buttons here on the top right are my fierce punching kicks. And so yeah, you'd probably want to remap the Street Fighter games in particular. But either way, it works just fine. Input lag is not bad at all. This is actually a lot of fun. So in that sense, I think when it comes to arcade gaming, if you do have an arcade stick like this, something that gives an X input signal like this, you're going to have a great time. Now, RetroArch will probably be the only one that plays out of the box like this. You'll have to remap the individual emulators like I showed with GameCube, but all the same, it does work. Okay, so wrapping things up here, do I recommend the SuperDock for Odin users? And I gotta say, it really depends on your use case. If you really want to play GameCube games or Nintendo 64 games using an original controller and you don't want to deal with having like a USB adapter and you're willing to live with the fact that you're going to have to remap your controls every time you go in between docked mode, then sure, I could see that use case. Number two, if you're the kind of person who wants to store a bunch of games on your system and you want to save a bit of money by using an external hard drive instead of a very large micro SD card, then sure, I can see that use case as well. Obviously, you're going to have to put your favorite games on the SD card so that you can use that in portable mode. But if you primarily plan on using it in docked mode, it does make sense to use that hard drive. And so in that regard, sure, that one makes sense too. But if you're looking to use this as a seamless integration to be able to start a game in portable mode, then dock it, grab your external controller, and just jump right back into the game, it's probably going to be more complicated than you expect. On top of that, the fact that it doesn't charge as quickly as I was hoping is a bit of a red flag as well because that was one of my biggest use cases too. Finally, when it comes down to it, all of these bugs and everything else, it kind of leads me to the fact that I would mostly just use this as a charging stand. So that way I can play in portable mode and then just plug it in when I'm going off and doing something else. 
and then just grab it when I'm ready to start playing again. That way I won't have to remap the controllers every time, and it does look pretty cool sitting on the dock like this. It is quite a bit more wobbly if you don't use that acrylic cover, but in that use case is just using it as a charging dock, it makes sense to use the acrylic cover too. And then I also do have the option to hook it up to my TV and play it that way if I do feel like remapping the controls and figuring out all the settings and all that other stuff. And of course it could also double as a second Nintendo Switch dock if you wanted to do that too. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this something you plan on picking up or did you pick one up already? And if so, how do you like it? Either way, I'm interested to see how the community kind of picks up on this little dock. Anyway, this is probably the longest video you'll ever see for the Super Dock, but I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.